Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session on platform technology as a toolkit for translation professionals. My name is Alinka Unk. I'm a translator and language technology coordinator at the Slovenian Department of the European Commission and will be moderating this session. We will look at how platform technology plays into the processes involved with producing translations. With me today are Ancha Lochan, COO at Native Translations, Pele Nauclear, co-founder and head of business development at Plint, Andrzej Nedoma, CEO at XTRF, and Katrin Marheinike, project manager at the European Language Grid. Before we begin, um, since we're all working from home offices, a few housekeeping items from me. Every speaker will have about 10 to 15 minutes for their presentation. You're invited to use this platform to ask your questions and upvote questions posed by other members of the audience. We will take two questions uh, with the most upvotes after each presentation. More of the questions will be addressed in our discussion after all the presentations have been delivered. All the presentations will be made available on this platform after the event. So, no worries for you if you have a technical issue in between, and fewer worries for me in that case. You can also see uh, use the chat function to discuss uh, the presentations amongst yourselves. And finally, those of you who use social media, just be yourselves and go wild with the hashtag 2020TEF. Our first speaker will be Ancha Lochan. She is the co-founder and chief operating officer at Native Translations, a Vienna-based online translation agency that offers professional translation, copywriting, and search engine optimization of uh, services in over 500 language combinations and 53 subject areas. Anshal's work is focused on making Native e the easiest, quick, quickest, and most reliable translation service and workplace for clients and translators alike. She heads the sales division, which is um, proud to count several Fortune 500 companies in North America and Europe as clients. Anchal holds a bachelor's in social studies from Harvard University and speaks four languages fluently. Of Indian and American origin herself, Anchal lives in Vienna with her husband and daughter, where she spends her time off hiking, biking, and baking. I wonder if she's ventured into sourdough like the rest of us a few months ago. Over to you, Anchal. Thank you, Alenka. Uh, pleasure to be here today. Um, yeah, today I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, do a short presentation uh, about us uh, and and how we as a platform have tried to simplify uh, uh, and automate processes around translations for our clients and for our translators. Um, yeah, so we're Nativey, uh, an online innovative translation agency from Vienna. Um, yeah, um, we we sort of set out to really automate all the workflow around ordering and managing translations. Um, we're proud to have one of the fastest uh, quote generations uh, in in the industry, um, and we'll we'll get that get 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 to that in, in a second. Um, we do focus uh, a lot on human translations and human customer care, so we have hundred percent customer uh, human customer care. Um, we were founded in twenty eleven and and work out of out of Vienna. And uh, we're, we're bootstra bootstrapped, and 92% of the company is, is owned by, by me and, and, and the other co-founder. Um, thank you, Anchal. You can um, continue with your presentation. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is uh, what what the what the start page or the home page on our web on our website looks like. Um, to you know, from the client perspective, to get started, you just click on instant quote, uh, and you come to to this screen where you can either upload a document. Um, if you're using API, you'd you'd have uh, a similar workflow where you could send content through API. Um, you then pick your languages, and within two seconds, you would see quotes on on price and delivery uh, for all the various languages, as you can see here um, on the right side. 
uh, when you click on uh, more details, uh, you would. So we actually show a, show our clients five different quotes for for every single language. And as you can see here, uh, we actually uh, show the translator and the proofreader uh, for every quote to the client. So transparency is a, is a huge issue for us at Nativee and something that we think uh, uh, you know something that can that can really improve the translation process um, and and experience both for translators and for uh, for clients so there's complete transparency as to which translator the the client is ordering uh, and every translator builds sort of their team of uh, every client builds their team of translators and you as you can see uh, you you see here with a picture and and the name which translator you're picking so you would see the delivery date you would see the price uh, and and the various translators and and there's a little bit of variation in the price um, uh, uh, depending on what the translators, uh, you know, what, what rates the translators have entered. And we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that in, in, in a second. So you pick the quote, quote that you like, then you just go ahead and click on proceed to checkout. Then you come to this screen, um, your billing address is already saved here. We also offer cumulative invoicing since a lot of our, uh, our larger clients uh, want something like that. Um, you can add a, a title for this job, special instructions. If you're ordering an IDML, you might want to upload uh, the PDF, the source PDF as an additional file here. So the translator has, has both views. Um, yeah, then you just go ahead and click on pay now and your order is placed. So it really takes just a few seconds. Um, once the order is placed, uh, you come to this screen, which is the online order overview, um, where you see all of your ongoing orders. Um, you can also organize orders by department. Um, and this is something that, that clients find, find really convenient. Um, so for example, you can see a few different groups here on, on the left side. Yeah. Um, when you click on click on the details on any of these uh, languages. Um, you can also chat with the translator and this is what that looks like. So this is another, uh, another thing that our translators and clients find extremely helpful, uh, uh, which is really to be able to have this direct line of communication that doesn't necessarily involve the project manager uh, as, a, as a middleman uh, in, in every scenario. Um, and the translator and the proofreader are also directly uh, uh, connected through the chat. Um, we ask the we ask the client to rate their translations, uh, which is another thing uh, that was brought up in my session yesterday, uh, which would translators find very very helpful to really know from from the client, uh, you know what they liked, what they didn't like, um, or to see any you know any revisions that they might have undertaken for the final version. Um, so, so translators can also see this uh, once the, the client has entered this. Um, we allow for company-wide order management, something I, I talked about earlier. Uh, so clients can sort of group uh, their uh, orders in, in, into different departments uh, and, and each department can have its own set of resources that the translators would then see. So if you're, if you're translating for the press uh, department or, you know, for, for, for the marketing department, uh, you know, the marketing department can upload in our system, you know, their style guide, their, uh, you know, all of their resources uh, and, and, and depending on which group the order is placed from, translators would see those resources um, for those groups. So that's, that's what it looks like to, to be able to manage that in departments. Um, all of our, oops, all of our project management is uh, done mainly by, by, by the software. And of course, we have project managers who oversee that process. But in the first instance, it's the software uh, that does the project management. So, uh, you know, as you can see here, you can see sort of uh, for every order, uh, we have different sort of bubbles um, that, that track the process. And this is what, what the view for our project managers looks like. Um, every action is also tracked and logged in our system. Uh, something that's also really helpful from a from a GDPR perspective and from a from a from an information security uh, um, digital security perspective. Uh, so we know exactly which translator or which person at which time had access to any resource for how long. Uh, and of course, from a project management perspective, we we, we exactly know how how far along we are uh, and where in the process uh, we've come.
Um, this is sort of uh, the order details from the perspective of the, the project manager. So when they click on any order, they can see, you know, who the translators are. You can chat with them right away. Um, yeah, our quality control, uh, uh, thanks thanks to our software, we're also able to have a very uh, detailed uh, 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 quality control process. So it looks somewhat like this. It, it, well, it's a five-step process. So in the first step, the translator does the translation. In step two, the proofreader uh, reviews the translation. In step three, the proofreader has to submit a feedback form uh, that looks like this and all of these different criteria. So you've got grammar, you've got style, you've got uh, uh, terminology. Um, it also has to put in a comment. And if the translation receives low marks in any of these criteria, the order is automatically locked. And a third translator uh, comes in to review uh, the feedback and, and see you know, whether it was justified, whether it was someone just having a bad day. Um, then in the fourth step, the translator and proofreader are again in direct contact through our chat where they where they exchange notes on on all the points they you know that were still open or they didn't agree upon. And in the fifth step, after this review process, uh, uh, the translator finishes the the final uh, version of, of of the of the translation and also gives a feedback to the proofreader. So, so this is what it looks like, um, and and this this feedback. Uh, 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 process for uh, in each step seems to be very helpful uh, for the translator and the proofreader. Um, yeah, this is what our what our team looks like. <laughs> We're kind of quite a young team. Um, these are some of our clients. Uh, we translate for a lot of banks, for, for corporations, uh, also for local marketing agencies. So it's, it, it, it's very, very varied. Um, our research and growth funding comes from European level uh, 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 institutions uh, and also from, from the Austrian government. Um, here, are, here are some of those references. Yeah, and that's me. Uh, we're very happy to have been uh, named one of the 100 best startups in Austria a few times in a row. And yeah, look forward to your questions and thank you. Thank you, Anchal, and thank you to the audience for asking very interesting questions. Um, the one with the most upvotes right now for Anchal is, how can you be sure that the turnaround time will be possible if you haven't talked to the translator before? Um, so every translator actually uh, has their their calendar in our system and and defines up front, uh, for instance, uh, you know when they like to work. Someone might say, okay, I'm available Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays from eight to twelve in the morning, and from five to eight in the evening. And based on that, our algorithm, uh, you know, we'll calculate the delivery dates, and our algorithm will sh will will pick uh, the best best match. Uh, for our clients, so so there is a calendar in the background, and cl and, and translators can also put in a, a vacation or, or put things on pause if you know if they're not available for a certain amount of time. So we do know <laughs> when you're available and when 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 not. Um, and, and, and linked to that, I also want to say that translators also add their own pricing in our system. So every translator decides what they will be paid for a job. So they enter their work. Uh, their rates per word. And based on that, based on the number of words that we calculate in, 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 in any job, that, that's, that, that, that's what they receive a, a, a job offer on the basis of. Thank you, Anchal. Um, the second question would be, uh, how do you know that clients are able to assess the quality of the translation at all, let alone in terms of grammar or punctuation? I mean, this this is this is a this is this is a classic issue. No matter uh, you know whether you work through a platform or a traditional agency, um, so you know uh, clients very often have uh, uh, their colleagues in in the various regions where where you, where you know the translation you produce uh, ends up being vetted. So so yeah, that's what it's on the basis of. Thank you, Anchal. Uh, we'll take some of the rest of the questions in the final um, discussion after all the presentations. But right now, we're moving on to our second speaker, uh, Per Nauclear. He is the founder and head of business development at Plint, formerly known as Nordisk Undertext, a leading subtitling company in Sweden.
He has spent his career in media localization and is a veteran subtitler and project manager. More recently, he is the architect behind Plint's new media ecosystem for content localization and distribution. Over to you, Pele. Thank you. Uh, let's pray for uh, this to work. Uh, and here we go. Uh, I hope everyone can see my screen. Uh, and also, uh, I've retreated to my basement as I had to steal my son's headset. I'm working from home, and he's looking for it. So hopefully, uh, uh, we'll get through this without him showing up. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, uh, I'm, I will be talking about media localization uh, a little today. And, and this presentation is really uh, a part of a larger presentation, which is called Disruption of, a, uh, uh, of an Industry. Uh, the format today is a bit too short for that, but I, uh, I'm not going to be here all week, but I do have a session this afternoon and be happy to talk more about it then. Uh, I don't use the word disruption very often or lightly, but when it comes to the evolution of a media uh, landscape, I can't think of a better word. Uh, the ways we consume media, news, music have changed entirely. Uh, in less than 10 years, we've grown uh, accustomed to any choice whenever we want it uh, or whenever it pleases us. Uh, the traditional media companies uh, have been more or less overrun by a new generation of players, uh, pure play uh, companies uh, who are uh, digital at their core and, uh, and very often data centric and mobile first. Uh, this new landscape has changed the playing field for media services companies uh, like Plint uh, that feed into these uh, digital supply chains. Uh, so, uh, a few words uh, about Plint, the company, then. Uh, uh, it was founded back in 2002 by myself and a group of subtitlers uh, with a mission to provide quality translations to discerning clients. I remember it, that's what it said. Uh, but as it turned out, there weren't that many uh, uh, discerning clients back then. So, we quite early turned to technology to, to pro at least provide smarter uh, services. We're still very focused on quality, of course, but uh, there you go. Uh, we certainly found our uh, client base uh, almost 20 years later. Uh, and in 2018, we were the fastest growing language service provider in the world. And we're still growing. Uh, we provide uh, a lot of different uh, media services, dubbing, voiceover, audio description, subtitling for the deaf and hard of hearing, and of course, mono and multilingual subtitling. Uh, we produce some 300,000 uh, minutes of subtitled minutes per month. It's a massive amount. And we are uh, around uh, and we're still uh, growing geographically as well. Uh, but before uh, I jump into the nitty gritty of media localization, uh, I'd like to give a, a pretty encouraging example of how media localization and perhaps localization is moving up in the value chain. Uh, uh, and a couple of years ago, uh, a global VOD platform or VOD platform was launched in a number of countries uh, in Europe. As they launched, uh, the, the company was keeping a careful uh, eye on two key markets. Uh, but what they found was that after the, the initial free trial period, uh, a lot of the users uh, uh, cancelled their subscriptions. Uh, they uh, tasked Gartner, uh, uh, an external research company, to investigate uh, and, and create a strategy uh, to avoid this churn uh, of, of users. And, and Gartner's recommendation was to do uh, what was called uh, a full globalization effort. Uh, in other words, to localize the product, all the metadata, and of course, provide uh, uh, subtitling and dubbing and access services to all the content. This was a massive effort. I was involved in it personally. Uh, but once it was rolled out again, the result was quite staggering. The, uh, the higher end of the benchmark that the company has set as a success uh, was uh, exceeded by more than 50%. Uh, this led this particular company, that shall remain nameless, uh, to elevate localization into what they call a prime asset, uh, along with video and uh, audio and that basically means that localization was no longer seen as a necessary production cost but an investment in customer acquisition and that's a much better space for 
uh, uh, localization to be. Uh, so what we're seeing really is uh, in the competitive landscape uh, uh, that has arisen, we see a move from, from price uh, as the main driver into quality. We also see that cost is, is seen as investment, which is, which is great, I would say. So, uh, we are a language company, and as, that, as a language company, uh, we're servicing the media uh, industry with localization services, such as dubbing and subtitling. Um, this used to be a pretty straightforward process uh, because of the so-called distribution windows. Uh, for example, uh, a big Hollywood movie would premiere uh, theatrically in the US, and then uh, after some time, uh, and, and, and initially, Assuming it was successful, it would travel and 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 premiere on on theaters around the world. Uh, after uh, a few months, that same film was released on VHS originally, then DVD and Blu-ray, uh, and then finally, in the so-called long tail, uh, it was licensed to pay TV and and, and then free TV. Uh, and Episodic content was even more predictable because it was produced to, uh, to weekly transmission schedules on the, on the TV channels. Uh, and providing localization services to, uh, uh, to these supply chains was fairly easy and above all, uh, quite predictable. Uh, but in the new media landscape, uh, these windows still exist to a certain degree, uh, but they are intertwined with original content production for all the VOD platforms. Uh, uh, they're also intertwined with license content deal because licensing content is becoming increasingly important as a revenue stream for, for all media companies. Uh, uh, this poses uh, new challenges. Uh, because uh, what you can have then is you can have a, a limited theatrical release uh, 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 in perhaps a few countries. And at the same time, uh, the film is released uh, on, on a VOD channel globally. Uh, or you could have a complete series uh, uh, that is uh, licensed to, to appear on a VOD channel uh, for binge watching uh, uh, before it even uh, aired the first episode uh, on a TV channel. Uh, so, uh, to rise to this challenge, then, uh, we as a company uh, need to be innovative and, and we rely on a, on a large pool or many pools of, of, uh, of expert translators uh, and our localization uh, ecosystem that we call Plint. Uh, and a few words about the technology company, because this is important for us. Uh, five years ago, we made a decision to become a technology company not a language company uh, creating software to, 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 for our own business processes, but a proper technology company. And today we develop and we license our technology to media companies such as Viacom, CBS, but also to multinational companies uh, like IKEA and public organizations like the Swedish government. Uh, we do this because we believe that the disruption uh, but ha and, and digitization that has happened in the media sector has changed the role of, of, of the language service providers. Uh, our mission is to use technology uh, to connect content owners with expert providers of language services. Uh, we have seen that this novel approach increases speed to market. It cuts, uh, cuts cost for the content owners, but most importantly, it allows for higher rates uh, to the translators. Uh, this is kind of a disruptive part of the disruptive speech that I normally give, but let's talk more about that if you're interested later. Uh, so, uh, as I perhaps mentioned earlier, uh, we are all about automation. Uh, when it comes to workflow orchestration, work assignments, setting and managing schedules, uh, managing payment and so on, we rely on automation. Uh, we make sure that we have uh, up-to-date data on our partners, i.e. our translators, our linguists, our QC, our post editors, what have you. Uh, uh, we have information around their skill sets, uh, preferences, domains, availability and qu quality metrics, uh, of course. And we use this data to match the most suitable linguists for a specific job. Uh, the flowchart, the mesmerizing flowchart we just looked at, uh, is taken from a fully automated subtitling workflow uh, that we have deployed for a Scandinavian VOD service. Uh, our project managers uh, monitor the, pro uh, the progress uh, and only work with exceptions, uh, i.e. they only intervene when they have to. Uh, 
Uh, this gives them a lot more time to to spend time on what matters, like supporting our linguists uh, on on languages issues, uh, uh, content related questions in general. Uh, okay, uh, Plint Core. Then, uh, when I started out as a subtitler, uh, almost. 30 years, bless my heart, uh, uh, we wrote down, uh, at my first job, we wrote down the subtitle text on, on checkered pads, you know, these uh, math pads. And the subtitles were then transferred uh, uh, by digitally, uh, to, uh, by a transcriber, an old lady. Uh, and finally, it was time coded in a separate lab. Uh, it was all very fancy and you didn't get to use the, the tech in the lab. Uh, and surely uh, subtitling uh, software was developed in the 90s and on, but the process was always very manual and the, and the software was expensive and, and complicated. So uh, cloud computing has been a game changer really in how we build our tools, especially the tools that uh, are used by our linguists. Uh, by leveraging the power of the cloud and content delivery networks, uh, we can build tools that only require a browser to operate subtitling dubbing or subtitling software. Uh, users can self-assign, get real-time data on quality metrics, uh, performance KPIs, communicate with each other or with anyone else on a project, and, and they can also execute payments for themselves. Uh, as a company, we develop many uh, cloud-based tools, uh, but I'm particularly proud of our subtitling tool, uh, uh, subtitling editor. It's, uh, it's browser-based, uh, yet it packs all the punch of a, of a desktop application. Uh, it has features such as frame-accurate stepping, short chains detection, customizable hotkeys, spell checks, real-time error reporting, cat integration, MQM tools, commenting, annotations, and more and more. I'm not going to sell that anymore. Uh, but more importantly, by using this as our platform, uh, we can onboard and train all types of translators uh, in the art of subtitling. Uh, and by applying style guide specific rule sets, uh, we can make sub the subtitling much more, uh, the process of subtitling much more manageable for translators not yet versed in editing and time coding. Uh, and this is very important for us uh, because the need for good translators is, is growing constantly uh, with, the, uh, with the rise of uh, new content producers. Finally, a few words uh, on AI because it doesn't escape our business and, and it shouldn't. Uh, uh, especially speech uh, to text and machine translation is gaining traction, of course, uh, in, in our space. And as a technology company, we're very keen to find smart solutions in order to meet the increased volumes and, and shorter turnaround times and, and, and create other efficiencies. Uh, but as a language company, uh, we're equally concerned about creating sustainable models uh, where the technology empowers our linguists uh, and that the outcome for them and for us as a company is, is better tomorrow than it is today. Uh, I think I'm done. Yes, I am. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Per, for the presentation. Now, the translation business and subtitling have come a long way since you started in this business and you've described the, the pathway of it um, quite mm -hmm. well. Um, do you have any thoughts on where the future is taking us? Oh, uh, millions. <laughs> I, I think that uh, media localization and there's, uh, uh, it's still such much, uh, some people like to call it a craft, some likes to call it an art. Uh, I would like to call it something in between. Uh, I think there is, uh, there is so much uh, room for improvement when it comes to uh, uh, eliminating the, uh, the, the tedious manual processes that you do as a time coding, uh, typing a lot of things, but, but the art, the, the condensing and the, uh, the uh, uh, the beauty uh, of subtitling uh, will, will remain regardless of, of, of what tech we, we put in there. Uh, so I think that uh, there's always going to be a need for uh, high-end localization, 
or, or, or subtitling. But uh, what we're also seeing is that there's so much content that now can be produced uh, by using uh, machine translation, by using ASR, uh, I, uh, uh, speech to text. Uh, so there, there's a broadening of, uh, of this. But there's also, uh, uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, traditional translators uh, coming over to media localization. We're really happy about that because there is a shortage of, uh, of, uh, of translators uh, uh, into uh, specific language combinations. So, so yeah, uh, that was a long-winded answer to a short question, sorry. Thank you for that. We have a question from the audience. Um, does the platform work for both translating templates and master files and creating subtitles from scratch? So timing, spotting. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we do our master files in the platform. Uh, and when it's monolingual subtitling, uh, we have Plint Academy uh, where we train uh, people on to how to use the, the platform. Uh, uh, so we prefer to have... Uh, you know, if you have Spanish into German, uh, we don't want to use a pivot template. Uh, we would like uh, a, a proper translator, uh, subtitler with the right skill set to do the translation uh, entirely. And, and yes, it supports that. So, uh, yeah, one more question. I um, don't see myself. It is everything working okay? I can hear you. Okay, hold on. Um, I think I'm back. Yeah, I'm back. Sorry about that slight um, <laughs> bug. Um, we will take um, some more of the questions later on. Uh, this is a very technical one um, that was uh, addressed to both you and to Anchal. Um, and I'll ask this one here, as I have plenty of uh, questions left to ask Anchal later. Um, so how many translator data points does the algorithm that matches each translator to each job take into account? Obviously, price is one, but what are the others? And what about for the new members who don't yet have a quality rating? Perhaps both you and Anchal can um, share your thoughts on this. Thank you. Sure. Do you want to go first? Sure. Um, yeah, uh, for us, um, we, we, we the availability. So there's the there's your you know how quickly could you turn around the job. There's price. There's area of expertise. So the 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 client would specify you know this is a contract or or you know this is in in this is an archaeological survey. Uh, and then we'd see, you know, does this match one of the areas, one of the domains that you specialize in? So there's, there's, there's those, those are the three main metrics. And of course, there's the quality rating uh, that we build for you with every job that, that you do on our platform, starting from, you know, how quickly you react to how often were you late? What was your feedback, et cetera. So it's really a mix of all of, all of those things. Uh and similarly uh, to us then, uh, I'd say the most important thing uh, for matching uh, uh, work, uh, we're as, uh, at least as a company and perhaps as a business is slightly different because we have fixed rate cards for fixed types of content, which means that uh, we, don't, we don't chase the lowest price because we have, you know, this is what's being paid uh, and that depending on, on rush and, and other uh, 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 other things that can uh, uh, affect the price, but uh, in general, uh, price is not uh, 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 an issue. Uh, the most important thing for us really is to match the uh, the translator's uh, interest with with the show. If you are an avid fisherman, uh, you're probably a lot better off to uh, translate a fly fish documentary than someone who never held a rod. Uh, so that's uh, we have a lot of uh, data on that. We use uh, historical data uh, a lot to see 
what type of jobs because uh, uh, the uh, interest is one thing, but you specify it as so translators. But we also uh, uh, grab the domains that you have received good uh, quality uh, scoring for, and, and, and because perhaps you're really good at something that you wouldn't say you are. Uh, so that's another thing. Uh, and then there is uh, loads of different data pools, KPIs when it comes to uh, uh, timely delivery. Uh, and uh, But we also have a system that can uh, uh, say, perhaps we don't want, It's perhaps it's not so important that you're timely. It's more important that you're really good at something. So then we can have the, the system uh, disregard uh, depending on the criteria-based rule engine that we use for, for everything. Uh, if you're new uh, with us, it takes some time, of course, for you to build your renome uh, and to build your, uh, then we use whatever you have decided uh, that you're good at. Uh, and the quality metrics, uh, well, uh, we, we do full QC of everything that people that start working for us. So pretty quickly, they at least get a, a benchmark or, or they get a, a benchmark level on, on, on their MQM scores and such. Thank you, Pele. And we're moving on to our third speaker, uh, Anje Nedoma, who is the co-founder and CEO of XDRF. Uh, management systems, a global translation management platform provider for translation companies of every size, in-house corporate language departments and public organizations. XTRF is a cloud-based end-to-end translation management system that helps manage your translation and localization workflows. His company has helped hundreds of translation and localization agencies in 30 countries to leverage their potential. He has been building his translation industry expertise since 1996, starting in his family business as a business development manager and a managing director for leading Central European translation company, uh, Lido Lang Technical Translations, which was eventually sold. Over to you, Anjay. Thank you very much, Alenka. Thank you for this introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, present to all of you today. That's probably the shortest presentation I have ever made at any conference. Uh, uh, universities, translation companies, uh, corporate departments. So there's lots of content uh, that they, I'd like to share with you. Uh, we have limited time frame here, so I'll at least address few information to each of you. And of course, if you'd like to expand, we'll have time to talk about this later. So as Alenka summarized, uh, XTRF is a tool that helps manage projects, manage translation projects, and automate as much as possible, if not everything within these translation projects. And by this nature, we are, of course, working with translation companies and uh, local uh, localization departments within organizations or uh, corporate um, entities. Um, and of course, we link the buyers, so the requesters, uh, requesters of translations with those who will manage the projects or project managers or, or within translation companies or within localization departments and when, with vendors or so translators, proofreaders who will uh, finally execute each of the tasks within the project. So of course, because uh, uh, we are organizing the project in that way, we have three uh, portals. The main portal, which we call home portal, is of course for project managers and there is lots of options and features that I will not discuss today, uh, but uh, I will only name a few. There is a dedicated portal for requesters who have kind of the window into the, into the system in which their projects are being managed. And there is of course the portal dedicated for vendors and translators and we'll talk about this a little bit later today. Okay, so first, what's in it? What's in XTRF for localization departments or translation companies? Well, first of all, um, because we are managing the process of project management and we are automating a lot of operations there, which used to be manual and can be now automatically 
uh, uh, executed, we are shortening the process by itself. And at the same time, we are reducing the cost of project management. If you look at the right side of, uh, of my presentation window, you will see there are two columns and they represent a typical distribution of cost within the project where the bottom part, which is 50%, is, is typically the vendor's cost. And then there is a, another huge part, which is uh, project management cost, which is uh, about one third of the total project value. And this is the area that we tackle most and we want to reduce it uh, very much even to zero uh, so that we can increase what is uh, left on top of the column, which is profit. So we can increase this even for or up to five times. And, and at the same time, of course, because everything is automated, also the delivery times, so the turnover of the whole process uh, can be reduced because we do not have to wait for project managers to uh, find time for each of the operations. They can happen automatically, like we have heard uh, right before today, uh, also in cases of uh, uh, language service providers like Anchal's company, Nativity, uh, Nativity sorry, uh, who uh, presented how they automated on their end similarly. Um, one thing I wanted to mention today for translation companies and localization departments is a new cloud product, which we call Extra of Business Barometer that we have developed because of COVID. Uh, early sp spring this year, we were asking uh, ourselves the questions, what we would like to know in this situation when everything is uncertain. And we said, we would like to know what happens to our individual clients, which of them reduces uh, volumes reduces the uh, amount of projects and orders that they place with us uh, because there we surely should direct our key account management forces to understand what's happening with each client and maybe find solutions uh, that will suit both parties and at the same time we wanted to know okay in this hard times there are always companies who find a new potential find new opportunities and they go up and we would like to know about this trend as well immediately because there is upsell potential and we should direct our sales forces there to work with those clients so we wanted to create a tool that would actively analyze all the trends in the behavior of particular clients and this is exactly this tool exterior of business barometer that we have delivered to our clients for free for this pandemia times but in fact it happens to be a great extension of regular business reporting tool that we had in the system before so that's something we are particularly proud of this year now let's move for let's move to translators providers vendors in general so what do we have for them uh, First of all, uh, vendor portal. I've heard many times from our clients and from many representatives of the industry that this is probably most, the most user-friendly vendor portal in the industry right now. It's very clear design allows the translators to find new requests, find new jobs, download the files related to, to this particular assignment find instruction and in a, a very easy interface also deliver the project back with any information or, uh, or instructions that they would like to move on uh, uh, downstream to proofreader or project manager. And of course, all the billing and other administrative uh, tasks can be handled through this vendor portal so that translators can really focus on what they love, which is typically translating, rather than administrative tasks. There is one more thing that uh, is great for translators, is also great for project managers. We have recently launched XTRF Chat, which is an instant messaging platform, instant messaging tool. Um, and what we do is we create the chat room automatically for each project which is being created. And we invite to this chat room every translator and project coordinator or manager that participates in this project. And by this, we streamline the communication because uh, not only it is instant, so project managers can communicate with vendors naturally very easily and, um, and very quickly. But also if we take into account or we think about multilingual projects with five or 25 uh, language combinations, then if there is a particular information 
spotted by one of the translators and he would like to distribute this information to all other translators who might be affected by this information or, or spotted bug in the source document or whatever. Uh, communicating this through a chat is very natural and everyone has access to this information immediately. Uh, doing this through email would be a nightmare. So not only one-to-one -one communication, but also many-to-many -many communication is supported automatically in this chat. And this is another tool that we just launched and we, we receive great feedback uh, from, from our clients. Of course, having this communication channel established through, uh, through uh, mobile applications as well uh, allows us to build on this addi additional features or offerings in future. One more group that we have on the, in the audience today is universities and students. Uh, I already had a few discussions today uh, with uh, representatives of, of this world and I'm very happy to confirm that we run a university program in XTRF. We support universities. If you are interested to include XTRF uh, or technology project management in your courses, we invite universities to benefit from uh, free licenses. Um, students typically uh, have classes about project management, running translation business, and they want to get to know uh, technology that supports this, like XTRF. And of course, this is one way of using XTRF uh, in academia. But the other one is during your translation classes or linguistic classes, uh, you can also have a professor playing the role of a project order, so buyer of translation. There can be project manager uh, selected from the students who will basically manage the project uh, on the platform and other students would play the role of vendors like translators and proofreaders uh, again in the platform. So if there are universities in the audience who would like to um, also benefit from this program, we are open to help you and please contact me after this presentation as well. So to sum up, uh, what I always like to see our companies, uh, we are not only producing technology, we are really delivering a certain experience. There is over 70 people working in my team right now uh, with hundreds of clients all around the world. And there is a, a huge group of dedicated people who really not only want to find about your business need and help you solve them with the system, but also do this with a smile, uh, with this uh, human touch, but everything, of course, certified to best quality and data protection rules. So I hope XTREF is much more than a product. It's an experience. Thank you very much. Alenka, over to you. What's this? Thank you, Andrzej. Um, what's going on with my camera? Hopefully it's there. Right. Uh, so there seems to be quite a bit of interest uh, in our audience with regard to why today about how to promote their work so that project managers could use them, could new translation uh, translators and basically benefit from their offering in, in their production. Usually project managers are so flooded with new requests and new jobs that they really try to uh, outsource the works, try to assign the projects to translators they know uh, will confirm or they know will deliver good quality, which means that they limit the choice of translation, translators to the very small group. Typically, it's about 5% of all resources that translation companies have in their, uh, in their platforms, in their lists. Of course, if we could expand uh, the pool of translators from which we will choose, it will not only mean that new translators can start cooperation with a translation company, but also 
there can be a certain price benefit because typically from the larger group we select the uh, benefit benefit in terms of pricing is also there so automation can help uh, both groups translators get get into new clients because they will uh, have the chance to get uh, the job uh, not only um, from the project managers that know them but also from the others that know, do not know them yet and at the same time a translation company can benefit probably from uh, a better price offering at the end. Thank you Anjay. There's another question coming from the audience. Um, the audience would like to know whether your company has its own translators or do you just sort of rent the program okay, so, for them so we, to use? Yes, so we are a technology company. We are not uh, offering translation services. We do of uh, providing translations, so we do not have our own translators. We offer technology. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we're moving on to our final speaker and we'll then thank take you. the rest of the questions that have been posed um, since the beginning of the session. Our last speaker is Katrin Marheineke, who actually at, at some point in time worked with Anjay, it's a small world. She is the project manager of the European Language Grid Project, ELG. She holds a master's in linguistics, American studies and Russian studies. After her studies, her work in the field of German as a foreign language took her to Eastern Europe. In 2006, she joined the translation industry where she worked as a lead linguist, business process and quality manager at Lionbridge and at Tax and Form in Berlin. In the EU-funded Horizon 2020 project, QT21, she or coordinated the linguistic annotation tasks. In January 2019, she joined the Speech and Language Technology Group at the DFKI, German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. Over to you, Katrin. Katrin Maheinicke. I'm the project manager of the European Language Grid project. Today I would like to present you another platform which slightly differs from the ones that we've heard before um, and this is the European Language Grid. So the motivation for our project is uh, that we want to become or that, that we think that language technology has to become a more important place in Europe. Uh, the reason is that Europe has not only 24 official uh, and 100 plus minority languages and also languages used by immigrants. Uh, language technology enables communication and cooperation across languages. Um, it secures equal access to information and knowledge. It helps equalizing uh, and giving a fair share in a common a digital market, it can help people with disabilities, um, and it helps promoting the language equality in Europe and that especially for under-resourced languages. The main challenge here is that Europe is very strong in the LT field on the one hand, but the area is highly fragmented with many small players and SMEs who are uh, working in this field. And this is where the ELG project comes into place. Um, the ELG project has been uh, kicked off in uh, January 2019. That is, we have been running for almost two years now. And our main objective is to establish the ELG as the primary platform and marketplace for language technology and to tackle this prob pro uh, problem of fragmentation in the European LT landscape. We want LT uh, to become a platform for commercial and non-commercial industry-related language technology, be it functional and non-functional. We want the European LT community to upload and have a possibility to upload and, uh, their services and data sets into the ELG, so, uh, to deploy them and to connect them and also make use of resources that were made available of other, by others. By that, uh, businesses can grow and benefit from scaling up, and we want to un unleash an enormous uh, potential for innovation that we see in Europe. 
Here you see the timeline of our project. We are pretty much in the middle of it. So we are now in month 2022. That is, we've already uh, released one um, uh, or, or launched our first release with services and tools. We have included data sets. We have uh, started with our first set of pilot projects. And we have also the first edition of our sustainability plan in place. So what is ELG? Um, basically, ELG consists of three ingredients. These are the ELG platform, the ELG content, and the ELG community. By platform, we mean the basic infrastructure of ELG, the back end and the front end. This is built with a robust and scalable, widely used technology, and this is constantly developed further. Um, the users, uh, or we have the ability to scale with this growing demand and supply of resources. So uh, this can be adapted to, to the growth of ELG. Uh, we have, um, or work, uh, have established an interactive modern web interface, and we provide the base technology for the catalog, catalog or directory of A, the functional services, and B, also for LT companies, uh, research centers, and research projects, because we not only want to present the content, but also want to function as some sort of yellow pages of the European LT. The second ingredient uh, of ELG is the content. By content, we mean services, language resources, data sets and tools, and the content of the catalog or the, the directory. We have, on the one hand, functional content that is running LT services that can be integrated into other systems. And we have non-functional services, uh, non-functional content, which is uh, language resources and data sets, but it can also be records of companies or research groups. The stakeholders um, are available to upload their, their own services and make them available um, via the ELG. And this happens via content, containerization. Um, so the LT service are con containerized, which is also known as dockerization. So this is an easy and efficient way for LT providers to create and upload their containers. Um, the third ingredient and pillar of the ELG is our LG, ELG community. These are stakeholders, our stakeholders, that is mainly LT providers and buyers, also research centers, universities and administrations. Plus we have our pilot projects, um, that we fund via the ELG, and we have a group of other projects that we work together with the ICT 29B projects, the AI for EU project and initiative, uh, MetaNet or LT Innovate, just to name a few. Also, we are establishing or have established a network of networks. These are the NCCs, our national competence centers. They serve as uh, international, as, 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 as a network and as national bridges to the, those countries. They help us identify content. Uh, they interest companies and let them know about ELG and spread the word. And uh, so that companies uh, learn about ELG and what, what its, its benefits are. Another uh, body that we are currently establishing is the European LT Council. This is an international pan-European body um, where, in which LT-related matters can be discussed and also coordinated. Um, in conferences, trainings, uh, presentations, social media and blog posts, we make ourselves known. And so this is also one of the reasons that I'm here today and talking to you. Um, so these are the three ingredients that ELG make. Basically, let's have a quick look at our first release and its features. So uh, the first, that is the current release, has, has been launched in May 2020. We have some features already uh, implemented here. These are user registration, authentication, authorization, user management. We have the possibility for LT uh, metadata upload, metadata conversion and harvesting from other uh, data resources is already possible. We um, People or users can, can browse, search and download uh, for LT data. Um, the LT service registration and integration is possible. We have a try out and run functionality in uh, ELG. We have also documentation on the APIs and on the platform itself in place. 
um, with the time uh, of the launch of uh, of our first release, we had roughly uh, 90 languages represented, uh, 580 data sets included, and 170 tools and services integrated. But these numbers are constantly growing um, as uh, the ELG is under development and constant enhancement. Uh, the roadmap for the second release is, um, uh, or on the, on the roadmap for, for the second release is LT data uploading. We refine our storage technologies. Uh, the processes um, and user rights and policies are more fine grained and more fine grained division uh, de de defined. Um, uh, batch upload of metadata and data where applicable is uh, applicable as possible. Uh, we implement our ELG catalog UI. Uh, also, we work on uh, enhancing the APIs um, for the integration and the, the service execution, and the documentation is also currently worked or constantly worked on. So this is a sna snapshot of an ELG search here. I've searched for the term machine translation. And if you hit the search button, there comes a, a row of, uh, of matches. He, on the left-hand side, you can see the services, the service types and technologies, and also the languages uh, that, um, the, that are involved. And if you click on one of those hits, then you get into another uh, window, which looks like this. Here you find all the, the details. So you get an overview of, of the tool or service. Uh, you get a link to the documentation. You get a link to the tryout uh, feature and also some code samples. And you learn, of course, more about the resource, uh, resource provider and get additional information. If you're interested in that, I recommend that you go to the live grid, which I will link in the end of this presentation, and then you can have a look for yourself and try it out. So who is our community? Um, our main stakeholders and users are the companies that develop, integrate, and purchase language technologies, but also these are universities and research centers. Um, and we also aim uh, or have in our stakeholder group uh, public ad administrations who also purchase and language, uh, use language technologies and professionals like translators or editors. Uh, moreover, we are uh, catering for um, other organizations like NGOs and also have funding agencies that, that support the development of language technologies in our, our stakeholder group. This is, of course, also administrations like the EC and uh, regional administrations. So uh, sustainability is an important topic because ELG is not just a project, but a long-term initiative. Um, for that uh, to be sustainable, ELG needs high availability and performance. Um, also, of course, people uh, things like uh, um, service level agreements, billing, functionalities, and support are needed, which we are currently working on. And all these requirements create quite some costs, as you can imagine. So, costs for bandwidth, hosting, the team, legal support, and so on. And uh, in order to um, to cover those costs on a long term basis, we are currently discussing business models. Um, so there are a couple of options, a, a for-profit company, a non-profit non company association, or also a foundation could be possible options. At the moment, we are discussing the, um, as I said, the, the models uh, that are in place and find a consensus hopefully very soon. And by the end of the next year of 2021, we aim at establishing our own legal entity. Um, in ELG, we also have open calls on pilot projects. Uh, these are projects that should broaden the ELG portfolio and the language technologies and data sets. And they will also, or they also demonstrate the usefulness of ELG. For that, we have uh, approximately 2 million euros in place and we can fund each project with roughly 200,000 or up to 200,000 euros. Um, at the moment, we have 10 pilot projects uh, running already, and the second open call is running until the end of November. Um, for that, SMEs or research organizations can uh, apply. 
So to summarize what I've just said, uh, at the moment, there's no current, uh, no, no scalable cloud, from, uh, cloud platform uh, available in Europe that serves as a broker for a broader variety of multilingual services, research resources or data sets. Um, we want to establish the ELG as the primary platform for uh, LT in Europe and by that bring together and unite a network of European experts. We want ELG to become um, a technology hub and a matchmaker for both LT industry and LT research. And we want it to become the marketplace for the whole LT business space. So to strengthen also Europe's position in this field. ELG, that's important to stress, is an initiative from the European LT community for the European LT community. And uh, if all that sounds interesting to you, I would really recommend or invite you to visit our project website, which is europeanlanguagegrid.eu, and check out our live grid, uh, which is live.europeanlanguagegrid.eu. Um, and uh, if you would like to learn more about uh, all sides of the ELG, I warmly invite you to uh, visit our virtual conference Metaforum, which will take place on the 1st, 2nd and 3rd of December. It's as usual free of charge and this year, like all other events too, um, in a virtual format. You, uh, check out our website here under Metaforum 2020. You find the, the register button, and uh, you're, we would like to see or would be very glad to see you there. And with that, I would like to conclude my presentation on ELG. I'm curious uh, about your questions, um, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Katrin. Um, now on to the questions. Um, our audience is interested to know but they would like to know what the top five busiest languages might be. Um, uh, maybe I should clarify this a little bit. So uh, I cannot say which are the busiest uh, at the moment in terms of which are um, which services are downloaded most. But what I can tell you now is, well, the most represented is English, which was for for several reasons. Then the second is I've just uh, looked it up. It's Czech, uh, German. French and then Polish. And the reason for that is that um, the I think our team consists of uh, um, um, also one partner from, from the Czech Republic and obviously they are working a lot of the Czech language and that's why we have many services already included that uh, work with Czech. So this is this is the reason why, but um, that doesn't necessarily mean that those are the most downloaded. So this is uh, this is a, a, a different analytics, which I unfortunately cannot uh, tell right. I think we may have lost Katrin for a moment. I'm sure she'll be back soon. Oh, you, Welcome back, Katrin. You, oh, oh, was my was my audio? Did did, did my audio? Yeah, drop? you were gone for a couple of seconds, but okay. no worries. So um, I don't know. Yeah, I just wanted. Uh, I just uh, said uh, um, that um, some the, the the most um, covered languages don't doesn't don't mean necessarily that they, that they are the most downloaded or the service are the most downloaded. So this is something different. This analytics unfortunately isn't uh, in place yet. So I cannot say that that might be something that we can uh, figure or they can tell in, in the next release. Thank you. Um could you please try to summarize into a very short description what ELG actually is and how translators can use it, how it helps? Thank you. Um, well, uh, maybe, uh, you know, or as I already mentioned on my slides, uh, translators are, of course, among the stakeholders. But the first and foremost, it's we are um, at the moment um, uh, or the most uh, focus group on is, is language service providers. But and, but everyone that is also, of course, editors and uh, the translators can use the, the platform. It's open and it's free. And if there are something, some tool, some service, maybe some uh, machine translation tool that you would like to use, you're, you're, everyone's free to use that. So at the moment, I wouldn't say that we have already very many uh, tools available that uh, 
that would serve for translators, but we have many machine translation tools and we are also uh, in our pilot project, there's also work, there, there's work on one uh, um, term extraction tool. I think that could be very interesting for translators. And so we are, as we are not selling uh, those, those products or those services, but that we are just, so we are just the place where they can be fed in and, and, uh, and offered to, to a public. Um, it's really open to the user what to do with it. It's not up to, uh, we, we, we don't tell anybody to do what to, what to do with which service. It's just people can search for it. You can think of it as, as a marketplace. And if there's something that's interesting, you can just try it out and download it and use it. Okay, thank you. Um, relating to this question, um, another one, it has to do with the funding and the origins of the ELG. So how is it funding funded? How is this um, connected to the Horizon 2020 program? Yeah. And where, where did the two million come from? Okay, so um, yeah, let, let me say some so word on the funding. Yes, as you see on my last slide there, I refer to it. It's a Horizon 2020 uh, pro program. I didn't go that much in much into detail with this, uh, with with the um, uh, start of of the ELG because of time uh, time reasons. So yes, it's a, it's a Horizon 2020 project, and it's funded. The whole project is funded with uh, roughly eight million euros, and the two million euros that I refer to with, with respect to the pilot projects, they are bookmarked and reserved uh, only for for funding other projects. So for for those those pilot projects, those fifteen to twenty pilot projects that we choose uh, that we have already selected partially and that that do um, develop services and and um, and tools that go into the ELG and that are offered via the ELG afterwards. Thank you, Katrin. Very interesting. Um, with this, we concluded the presentations part of it and are moving on to the discussion part of our session. Um, so we will start with uh, the questions asked for uh, Anchal Lochan. The first one would be, in my experience as project manager, we experiment every day lots with lots of variables and unpredictable events. For example, a client asking to anticipate a part of the text to be translated, a client sending three versions of the same text in one day. How do you cope with these issues? Um, yes, so, you know, yeah, <laughs> lots of variables. That's that's part, part of the business. Um, upload uh, a document on our on our platform and see a quote so so if they anticipate that they're going to have a, 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 a translation they want to see how long it would take or what it would cost we always encourage them to upload something uh that, that's approximately the same size and, and 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 have a look so that's how we deal with that um and then sending various versions um it doesn't happen very it hasn't happened very often in my experience uh but when it does uh the Clients and translators are in direct contact through our chat. So very often, you know, if you already started working on something and a new version comes along, uh, you know, the, the, the client is able to communicate with the translator and see how far along they are and say, you know, we changed a paragraph here or something like that. And so I think that direct contact is, is really helpful in, in managing uh, situations like that. Thank you so much. Um, another one with... Uh quite a few upvotes is quotes are instantaneous. Does this mean that there is only one rate per translator? What about differences in source text or the quality thereof making it harder to translate? How, how does your system cope with that? Um, so yeah, so there's definitely not one fixed rate <laughs> uh, uh, for translators. So like like I mentioned earlier, every translator uh, puts in their own rate for you know per word for for translation and, and proofreading. Um, and our platform um, trans clients do also see a little blurb uh, uh, if you know if they go into the details about each translator. So someone might say, hey, this person's a little more expensive, but you know they have 20 years experience. Uh, uh, translating legal content and for that reason I you know I would be happy to pay you know 
20% more or, or what have you, um, you know, for, for to, to have that expertise. So no way do we want to engage in any kind of price dumping. Uh, uh, and very much to the contrary, we, we really want to put the translators in the driver's seat and say, you know, what's fair pricing for you? Please enter that in, in, into our system. And then, of course, the only thing the algorithm does is, is uh, you know, sort of take care of the extremes. So, you know, if you're very, very high or, you know, very, very low, then it's somehow not a serious quote uh, uh, from the translator side. But, but. But, uh, you know, barring that, uh, you know, it's really also about your expertise and, and your experience um, and also showing that to the client. Thank you. So, pricing um, and how much translators earn really is quite a hot topic all around. So, I would like to ask uh, the other speakers if they would like to comment on this or share their thoughts on how the new technologies are affecting um, the earnings of translators, for example. Sorry, I'd love to, if I could. Go ahead, please. Oh, cool. Uh, I saw uh, this is uh, in part also uh, the answer to a question I saw in the uh, in the Q and A. How how uh, technology helps raise the uh, the rates of translators, and I would say everything. Uh, uh, or by uh, how how does becoming a technology company uh, aid that? Uh, I think that part of the disruption uh, that is. Uh, that, that is due uh, uh, and already is happening uh, to a large extent is that the value that we bring as a uh, language service provider, which is to uh, uh, facilitate the, uh, the localization of a piece of content, be it a metadata text translation or, or a subtitle file, uh, is really the relationship we have and the workflows that we can put in place for uh, our clients to uh, to get that work done. Uh, when you uh, allow or when you put technology in the hands of your clients instead, or as we do, uh, you cre create a direct link between the translators and the content owners. Uh, that gives, uh, 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 because then a lot of the overhead uh, that is associated with, with, uh, with a localization service provider uh, goes away because we put automation in place which means that all the stuff that we normally need to charge for uh, uh project management uh payment scheduling all of that stuff is being done automatically and the, the return on that investment should be not only our clients or and ourselves that money goes into uh, goes into uh raising the rates of the translators so we in fact pay uh, for at least for with some of the projects not every client is as eager uh, to pay as much but with some clients clients we pay up to 30 40 50 percent more than the normal market rate due to this automation so i would say that technology has everything to do with raising the, the rates of translators thank you yeah, I, and uh, can, oh go ahead yeah if i can add something to this i think also technology uh, can help raise, raise efficiency and basically what we earn is not only our uh, unit price per word but also how much of units can we produce each hour or each day uh, and I, I think every time we talk about efficiency coming from technology we are in fact talking, talking about producing more in less time and thus even though the uh, unit rate can be lower, the outcome is higher. Uh, and of course, I would also uh, support what Per just said. Well, basically, companies are always squeezed between you know the uh, the budgets that uh, clients have and the increase in rates in rates that uh, translators would like to expect. So what they have to do is really uh, cut costs internally or eliminate some costs internally so that they can still maintain their balance even though they are squeezed for, from the both sides. So technology naturally supports that was, as well. Um, I have another question that can be directed to uh, more of you. Please, please do remember to mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Thank you. Um, so the satisfaction 
is quite clear when we look at the um, clients receiving the translations, but do you also run satisfaction surveys among the translators who use your tools or platforms? Um, Anchal, perhaps, and then the rest. Yes, yeah, so um, we are actually in very close contact with our translators. They, uh, you know, at the end of every of every job, they have the opportunity to to give us feedback on, you know, how the how the process went, and uh, you know, if there are any if they're not happy with the new feature or if they want another part of the system automized. In fact, a lot of our uh, uh, most of our <laughs> uh, new feature requests uh, on the client side and on the translator side. Um, uh, come from from this feedback that we receive, uh, you know, and and way back, I don't know, we've we've been in business now about ten years, but, but one of the earliest features that we introduced for for translators was the vacation button, uh, uh, where they could just say, hey, you know. I'm off for these two weeks. Don't send me any jobs, uh, and and that too came on the suggestion of a translator. So so absolutely, uh, uh, you know, um, including uh, and optimizing our platform based on on feedback from from clients, clients and translators alike is 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 a key key feature in our software development. Uh, I could perhaps add to that uh, a little as well. Uh, uh, the automation uh, that we receive, uh, or or the time that we re uh, the, the saved time that we receive through automation means that we can spend a lot more time with in communicating with our translators, which is which are our most important resource. All the technology aside, uh, so we have a team of some fifteen people that do nothing but, but communicate and help translators out. We have feedback channel loops, which basically means any feedback they receive from client, QC, uh, MQM uh, workflows uh, is uh, is presented to them. Uh, so, uh, And that's linked to our Plint Academy so they can improve on, on the stuff they need to get better at. And also, if we receive, which we do frequently, a great translation that is instantly uh, being passed on to the translators as well. But I think automation uh, brings to the table that we can, as companies, bring some value uh, uh, to the table because uh, all the other stuff is automated. Then we can bring uh, the, the support to, uh, to our translators. Uh, 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 so, so that's the main business that we do these days. I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. The automation gives us the time to do that. Okay, thank you. A very specific language for you, Per. Um, how does changing from a language company to a tech company lead to increases of, of okay, sorry, that was, was actually, I'm sorry about that one. Um, they, people wanted to know how um, the change of your model um, affected the fees. Um, they go up. <laughs> That's really good news. But uh, this question, you mentioned there is a shortage of certain languages, but what are the most needed language pairs? Where do you find that the shortages are most apparent? Uh, this is uh, normally when you have a big VOD provider that launch in a new territory, uh, and more often uh, where you don't have a strong media localization tradition, uh, then I would say if we, for instance, launch in, uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm not going to say a language because perhaps I have a very strong, and this is, this is vendor management expertise, not mine. Uh, but if we uh, launch in a territory uh, where you don't have a lot of media localization, then we reach out to, uh, uh, and we have a lot of, uh, incoming uh, applications, of course, and we have a, uh, a system to, uh, to filter out the most interesting candidates, because I saw there was another question, what we're looking for in, 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 a, uh, in, a, in a translator. Uh, uh, but we ask a bunch of questions, which gives us a sense of whether or not that translator uh, might become a good subtitler, uh, also based on their skill sets and, and interests and, and ambitions, really. Uh, but uh, I would say currently uh, 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 African languages uh, are 
of great interest to us because there is a lot of launches, uh, big launches in, in Africa, India, uh, Asian languages. Uh, so, so those things vary. Uh, but what happens is that once uh, one of the big vote platform has launched in, in a territory, normally uh, the others follow. Uh, so there's usually a big onslaught in the beginning, but then there's pretty steady work into those languages uh, ongoing as well. Thank you. I have a, a question here for Anjay. Uh, if you do not offer translation in how many languages do you work and how would your company um, be useful to freelance translators? Okay, so, so, so first, uh, I'm not sure if I get this first question. We are a technology company and we provide technology to localization department and translation companies, right? So they have their vendors, their resources in their uh, instance of XTRF, right? So they have their in independent pool of, of freelancers that they use through our platform, right? So we do not provide freelancers to each of our clients. Each of our clients rather collects uh, and maintains the list of freelancers that they want to work with or they uh, keep in their individual databases right and then uh, the second question you say how can we be useful to freelancers well that's that's what i often hear for uh, from freelancers that they prefer to work for a translation agency who has xtrf because the interaction in the project and then all the billing and uh, and uh, financial related procedures are easier when the agency has xtrf rather than different, um, uh, different platform. So what we can do is we can really uh, improve the way translators or freelancers communicate with their clients, whether those clients are translation companies or localization departments within corporate uh, organizations. Uh, I think that's uh, answering these questions. Thank you, Anjay. Um, I have another one for Anchal. Would clients not prefer to have some personal communication prior to confirming the order? If they already have translators they trust, I can understand why they'd like this system, but what about the first project? How do they choose a team? And relating to this, um, how does a translator get their first job? Um, yeah, so... Well, that that's where we, as uh, as the language service provider, as as the as the agency, come in, right? So we vet. We're not sort of uh, we're not an open marketplace where everyone can just sign up and and as soon as you sign up and 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 put up your profile, it just goes live. Um, so you know, we spend a lot of time doing doing quality control. It's 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 uh, one thing. You know, it's one of our core competencies vis-a-vis -vis our clients. So every single translator that shows up on our platform has been vetted by uh, by our quality control team. Uh, they've done test translations very often uh, to really determine that, uh, you know, they, they meet our quality standards. Um, so when a client is, 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 is uh, you know, ordering their, placing their first order uh, with us, they can be sure that our quality control team, our project managers are ensuring that they're going to receive a very high quality translation. Uh, and then, of course, over time, uh, you know, uh, you can, you know, they, they, they try out different translators or, you know, they're, they're happy with uh, who they worked with. Uh, and then so, you know, this sort of team built over over time. Um, but uh, but yeah, so there is no uh, communication with the translator that's necessary right right off the bat. Um, and how do you know they sign up? We bet them. Uh, once their profile is ready, uh, they go live, and then they're shown to 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 clients um, uh, based on you know their areas of expertise and their availability and 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 uh, and all of these criteria. So so yeah. That's that's how it works, and of course, we we ensure that we have enough uh, work on the platform that they, they they would get jobs. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, for Katrin, this time um, you couldn't really go into the languages that would be 
best represented at um, ELG, but could you perhaps tell us which areas of technology are most sought after? Well, where is the interest greatest? What do people look for the most? Um, maybe before I answer this, it's, it's uh, still a little bit too early to analyze that because the, the system is only live for a couple of months. So we have only, I mean, we have services there and, and various technologies. This is uh, MT for, once, for one thing, text-to-speech, automatic speech recognition, um, and also information uh, extraction. And there are services now, as I said, around about 500 or 600. Um, uh, but I so the yeah we we what we are now doing is doing the marketing for the European language grid. So it's not yet in a stage where we can say okay we have today we had uh, three hundred downloads of this and that uh, um, MT tool also. So this is something that we, that will happen in the near future. But uh, the first public release is only open there for three or four months. Um, so uh, yeah, we don't have these analytics yet. That's something that's that's going to happen hopefully very soon if the word is spread and and people get to know this platform and um, understand better what what it can do. But um, as I said in the beginning, I know of course what I can say is which languages are represented. That's out in the open; everyone can see that. But I cannot yet say which is. Uh, which services are and which uh, languages are downloaded the most. This is something that will come in the next releases where we, where we will introduce those analytics. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you to all our speakers and thank you to the audience for sending the interesting questions. I'm afraid that's all the time we've got. Um, the debate was interesting. The presentations don't forget will be uploaded um, after the session ends it will be available on our platform i would also like to thank our technical team for all the support and the hard work they've invested in this event and uh, i hope i haven't clicked too many wrong things during this session uh, the next one begins at 4 p.m. Professional platforms joining forces for a strong and resilient language industry during and post-COVID. That's all from me. My name is Elenka Wunk. Have a great day.